Well, as we begin this morning, we're going to eventually find ourselves in 1 Corinthians 15. It's going to be a little while before we get there, but that would be the spot uh, that you would want to find in your scripture. I'll be referencing some other places here in just a moment, but that would be the place that, uh, that we'll be landing kind of with the bulk of what we talk about. And as I begin, I want to make sure that I say a huge welcome for the first time online to our chapel at Cheek to Waga Friends. We're really excited that you're tracking with us. So you just heard, uh, you heard the Lockport campus and the Crosspoint campus together uh, being able to say, glad to see you guys, part of our church family there in Cheek to Waga. Hey, uh, here's the thing. The afterlife matters. And there have been countless books and countless movies, um, countless television shows, whether they were comedic or serious or mocking or whatever, that have touched on the theme of the afterlife. But here's the thing, it matters. And the reason it matters is because maybe all of us have lost somebody that we love. It matters. Now, the thing is, is we don't think about it very well. All you have to do, you do what I do, and unfortunately, part of my job is I do uh, some funerals. Um, we have a bunch of pastors here, and they do a bunch of them, but all I have to do is I have to go on and observe at the funeral home website where people put in their online condolences or their uh, online, you know, tributes. And I can read those and I can figure out very quickly what people's conception of an afterlife looks like. And I'd be the first one to tell you that there are many cases where it looks nothing like what the scripture actually talks about. And we've been inundated over the last number of years, even in the Christian community, with a bunch of books that talk to us about the afterlife. And many of them are kind of uh, uh, near-death experience type books that, you know, we have the opportunity to, to read and find out what it's all about. You know, books like um, 90 Minutes in Heaven by Don Piper or some other books. Uh, there was a book called uh, To Heaven and Back by Mary Neal, and there's a book called... Uh, uh, My Time in Heaven by Richard uh, Sigmund, and then, of course, one that you guys probably know, Heaven is for Real uh, by Todd Burpo, talking about his four-year-old son, Colton. Now, the interesting thing about all of these books is that um, they oftentimes give us different pictures of heaven. So one is talking about heaven this way, and another one's talking about it this way, and another one's talking about it this way, and another one's talking about it this way. And sometimes those uh, accounts actually don't just, um, aren't just different, but they actually contradict. But they're actually not saying the same thing. They're actually saying quite the opposite thing of the other. For instance, in one of those books, it talks about when, you know, when I went to heaven and, and everybody there had wings. In another, one, in another one of the accounts, it says, no, 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 not everybody had wings. Just a few people had wings. First of all, I'm not really sure where the wings things come from. <laughs> I hear it all the time, and my best guess is that it comes from a poor reading of Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, where he was talking to the Sadducees about the resurrection, and he said this, in Matthew 22, at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. I wonder if people just took that idea and said, oh, we'll be like the angels in heaven. We must, we're going to have wings. Jesus wasn't talking about wings. He was talking about marriage. That's what he was talking about. So you've got some of these particular conceptions. And then in one of those stories, it actually recounts a room that is set aside in heaven for people so that uh, maybe if they haven't yet really come around to a place of deciding if they're going to follow God forever, that this will be the room where they can wait and decide eventually. That's in one of those books. And then there's another one where it talks about a, a description of the Holy Spirit as bluish. Now, 
some of you are saying, and my, my job isn't up here to, uh, to, to necessarily mock. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just kind of telling you what's being said in some of these books because the truth is, is that most people in the United States know more about what these accounts say than they do about what the Scripture says. So we need to balance that and understand it a little more fully. And in fact, Christian, the Christian community is not the only community, by the way, that gets in on this act. There are plenty of other people that get in on the act of, uh, of you know, telling I, I was dead kind of stories and here's what it all looks like. Um, there's a lady who wrote a book. Her name was uh, Anita Morjani. She's a Hindu. And she wrote a, a book called Dying to Be Me. And in that book, she chronicled her kind of death experience. And she said that what she saw was that God is in everything and is everywhere. It was a typical Hindu kind of description of what that would look like. And then basically said this, said, I learned from my visit to heaven what the secret of a happy life is. And she said, the secret of a happy life is to be happy with yourself. That's what she brought back from heaven. The secret of a happy life is to be happy with yourself. Or maybe it's a book like uh, Asmina Suleiman wrote, who's a Muslim, who talked about uh, her death experience and going to heaven, and it's called A Passage to Eternity. And in that particular book, she chronicled that when she went, she had to experience a number of life reviews. She didn't say life re review singular because she had been reincarnated a number of times and so had to then go through each life's life review. Now, again, I, I'm, some of you may be like, well, I'm, I kind of like, uh, you know, reincarnation. Okay, man. Okay. Okay. Um, one thing I've always thought about reincarnation is it seems like it would be very complex to celebrate birthdays. Is it just me? Happy 62nd, I mean 462nd, I mean 1062nd birthday, right? It'd be a little awkward. So you, everybody's kind of getting in on the act. People die, they write a description, but maybe they're writing conflicting ideas. By the way, the book Heaven is for Real is the biggest seller in evangelical Christianity over the last decade. Amen. Biggest seller. I don't think that's a good thing, by the way. I'm going to explain to you why. I'm sure that the people who are writing these books, by the way, I don't know them all. I know Don Piper is a Southern Baptist pastor, and I know one was a little four-year-old kid and sweet, you know, kid. I mean, he's gr grown a little bit now, but I I'm, not, I'm not taking a dig at saying that these people didn't see or experience what they saw or experienced. But here's the thing. Listen closely to what I'm about to tell you. I believe that they saw and experienced what they saw and experienced. I just don't believe that I have to believe that that was heaven. I have no responsibility to believe that that was heaven because I have a more sure word, a far more sure word than just what happened there. I'm not suggesting that they didn't see or hear or experience what they saw, heard, or experienced. But when those things are in conflict with one another, actually telling different stories about things that are contradictory, we're not going to get that kind of contradiction when we're talking about the truth of what God has revealed to us. And by the way, there's a lot maybe that we don't know. I'm not suggesting that people couldn't see. But here's what I want to remind you of. When we look at the Scripture, there's really four primary people who had a vision of heaven. You, somebody like Isaiah, somebody like Ezekiel, somebody like the apostle John and the apostle Paul. You could maybe throw in a Daniel or someone like that as well, but those four primary people had visions of heaven. And by the way, none of those visions had to do with near-death experience except maybe Paul. I'll come to him in just a second. But all the rest of them were visions that God gave of what kind of this thing looked like. And every one of them was not concerned with some of the ancillary silly detail that some of these other people are talking about. They were concerned about and they were ruined by and they were absolutely in awe of the majesty and glory of Almighty God. Every single one of them. Now, you take the Apostle Paul, for instance, and the Apostle Paul, he did get beat basically nearly to death, and some uh, theologians have argued that maybe it was during that time that Paul spent a little bit of time in the third heaven because he said, I don't really know how I did that. But you want to know what's interesting? 
Do you know what Paul said about his visit to heaven? Listen to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says this. He's speaking kind of in the, I know a man in Christ. He's speaking kind of, uh, you know, humbly. He's talking about himself. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. Here's what we've got. We've got a man who experienced, in some sense, heaven. He didn't talk about it for 14 years. And when he did, he said, I can't talk about it. So much for writing a book. <laughs> it's not what he did. It's not what he did. Now, here's what I want you to pick up on. We get three sentences from Paul after 14 years. He's been to heaven. 14 years later, we get three sentences saying, I'm telling you nothing. I can't even speak of it. That's what you get. It's astounding when we begin to think of it. So here's what I want to do in the limited time that I have. I, I want to tell you what I'm about to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you about it. <laughs> I'm going to tell you really about two things, okay? I'm going to tell you that there is life after death. And then I'm going to tell you that there is life after life after death. Those are the two things I'm going to tell you. You go, I don't understand the second one. We'll get there. We'll get there in just a minute. Here's the first thing. There is life after death. There's no question about that. You can jot that down. There is life after death. Now, I want our conversation to be aimed around believers. I'm not going to expand the conversation right now when we talk about those who who die apart from God or not believing in God because over the next few weeks, we're actually going to have an opportunity to cover that as well. But today I want to aim our conversation at believers. Now, when we think of this idea of life after death, most, most, not all, but most of the people that I talk to have a tendency to think about it in terms of maybe some of the songs that they've sung or some of the things that they've grown up talking about maybe in their church background. I can't wait for my mansion in glory. Now, don't get me wrong. That is coming out of a passage of scripture in the book of John chapter number 14. In fact, listen to the words of Jesus when he says this, my father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Some of the older translations actually use the, the phrase, my father's house has many mansions. But the idea of that word, rooms or mansions, is the word monet in the Greek language. And that word in both the old interpretations of how that word was used and in kind of understanding the nature of how Greek uses that term most often, it is most often used, ladies and gentlemen, about a temporary abode. It is also used sometimes of that which is permanent, but it is most often used when it's talking about a, a temporary stopping off point, a place of rest. Think more in our context, think a hotel on a journey. Think of a, a, a youth hostel when you're touring in Europe. Think of something along that line, because it is not necessarily thinking toward a permanent, eternal spot. Some theologians actually uh, take this passage of Scripture to help us understand something as well, because Jesus was actually talking about this idea in metaphorical language of a family, that when you are building rooms onto something, that's exactly what they do in the Middle East. In fact, when you're there, you can even see it now, that there are places that started out like this but continue to get built on because of the addition of family. And this is the idea that Jesus was really talking about here. I would suggest to you that it's quite possible that the passage in John chapter 14 is not trying to give us a description of what the forever destination and abode looks like for who we are and what we do, but instead is talking about the family of God being united together and that this might actually potentially be describing, because it's very difficult when you talk about things that are hard to understand or know, but this might be potentially describing a stopping off point 
on the way to a further destination. Some of you are going, dude, man, whew, whew, I don't know what's going on here. Well, let, let, me, let me help you understand. Because if that place that we're talking about, the father's house that has many rooms in it or a place for everyone might actually be located in a place that we might refer to as paradise. And it helps to give us some understanding because remember when Jesus was on a cross and there were two thieves on either side of him. Do you remember that? One of those thieves finally came out and said these words, in fact, in, uh, in Luke chapter 23. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And here's, here's what he was thinking. He was thinking some way future time. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, some of us immediately, we just don't give thought to this and we think, okay, paradise, it's just referring to, it's just another word for heaven. But here's the thing. When we use the word heaven, so much goes into our thought process behind what that word means that I'm trying to kind of pull out each strand a little bit so that we understand what we're talking about when we say it. Because for some people, when they use the term heaven, it just means this kind of disembodied existence where I'm just kind of chilling with Jesus. That's what it means. And I would suggest to you that though that might be a part of a description of what we're talking about when we talk about life after death, it is far from complete. In fact, when we talk about this idea, we need to understand the way that Paul even referred to it because if we have this idea of paradise where it may be a, a place that we are with Jesus when we die, Paul actually began to unpack this a little more in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. I want you to listen to what he says. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed... We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God who has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we're always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we at home in the body or away from it. Now, I've taught on this passage before. Years ago, you can look it up on the chapel.com, what happens after we die, if you want to do that. And I've unpacked this passage a little bit more. But let me give you just a, a quick snapshot so I can move to what I want to talk to us about. The quick snapshot is this. Paul is talking about a time in our lives when we actually exist in an unclothed place. And we long for that time when we're clothed. And he talks about being clothed with immortality, that idea. It seems as if what Paul is referring to is that after we die, there is no question about it because he actually makes the argument. And he does the same thing, by the way, in the book of Philippians where he talks about this idea early on in it, but he, but he is actually kind of presupposing what he, what he actually gets to later on in Philippians chapter 3, which, was, which is a different destiny that's not the same as what happens right when we die. But here in this passage, he's talking about being unclothed and clothed. The idea that when we die, there is no question that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This is what Paul is talking about. He's talking about an idea that after we die, that we, maybe in our soul form, are present with the Lord. Our bodies, which are decaying, may be dead or laying in the ground, but we, in terms of the inner person of who we are, the soul of who we are, are with or in the presence of Jesus. So we certainly can say this, and if you want to jot this down, you can. When we talk about life after death, it's fair to say this. When a believer dies, he or she is resting safely in the care and presence of Jesus. 
Okay? When a believer dies, he or she is resting safely in the care and the presence of Jesus. Now, I would not suggest, as some theologians have done, that this is a soul type of sleep. Because why in the world would Jesus say to a man hanging on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise? He should have just said, today you're going to be sleeping, I'll wake you up whenever. <laughs> right? I'm not suggesting that in any way. It would seem to presuppose nothingness. But instead, there is a conscious presence. Why would Paul, in fact, say, uh, man, I, I, I look forward to the time when I am absent from the body but present with the Lord if that was an unconscious state, right? Paul would not have any desire or looking forward to that kind of time. So at the very least, what we can say is we can say that when a believer dies, he or she is resting safely in the care and presence of Jesus, certainly in a, in a conscious way. But I would suggest to you that this is where so many people's theology of the afterlife stops. And it's so incomplete. If the scripture is reminding us that there is maybe a temporary stopping off point, maybe we call that paradise, we're using the term that Jesus used, but that we will be in the safe care in the presence of the Lord Jesus in our soul state. In fact, if you want to see this, you can actually look in the book of Revelation and you can see where it chronicles souls that are under the altar awaiting the time of the complete fulfillment. They were martyrs, but you can still see this picture. But I would suggest to you that it's not complete. Here's why. Not only is there life after death, but there is life after life after death. I'm borrowing Bishop Wright's term here because I like it, but it describes for us what we need to understand. There's not only life after death, which we just talked about, but there's actually life after life after death. Some of you are going, right? It's okay. I'm going to help you with that. Here's what I'm going to tell you. It's real simple. You want a definition of what life after life after death is? Here you go. Resurrection. That's what it is. Resurrection. Do you know how many people's theology of heaven is absent of resurrection? Yeah. It's absent of it. Like it doesn't exist. That's why I want us to concentrate on what Paul has said ultimately in 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to take a jet tour through the chapter. It's a big chapter and we're going to take a jet tour through it. But here's what I want us to grab hold of. Our theology of the afterlife, our conception of the afterlife should be organized around resurrection. That resurrection ought to be the centerpiece around which we organize how we think about the afterlife. It will actually clear up so much of the problematic way that we view this idea of what we call heaven it would actually help us significantly if we organized around the idea of resurrection because that's ultimately where Paul is going. That's ultimately what Paul's trying to say and teach us. And by the way, this is a guy that went there. He's got something to say regarding it. Now, he's writing to the church at Corinth, and Corinth did not really believe in the idea of resurrection. It was not something that was uh, akin to their way of thinking because of their pagan background, and they didn't really think about resurrection, and he, probably for this primary reason. It'd be the same reason that people in the United States don't believe in resurrection. Because dead people don't live again. That's why. That was the primary reason that they didn't believe in resurrection. It's the primary reason that, that most people that we talk to don't believe in it either. But it is fundamental both to the gospel. And it is fundamental to Paul's theology. You see, in Corinth, much like in the United States, even in some of the books that we read about heaven, the idea is this, is that spirit and soul is good and body is bad. Well, that was the idea of the Greeks. This is nothing new. So this is why this is very, very pertinent for us, just like it was to the people of Corinth. So I want us to see how incredibly central the idea of resurrection is, not only to the gospel, which, by the way, sometimes the gospel is preached, and all that is preached is Jesus died for you, Jesus died for you, Jesus died for you. That is not the fullness of the gospel. 
In fact, Paul's going to make that very clear. I want us to look at how central this is. Look in, beginning in verse number one of 1 Corinthians 15. It says this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And then skip over to verse 12. It says this, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost." If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Do you see how central the resurrection is? Not only to the gospel, but to what Paul is trying to teach us. Paul is saying to us this. It is fundamental in the preaching of the gospel that you preach Jesus resurrected from the dead. That he died for our sins according to the scripture. That he was raised again according to the scripture, and that if we miss that part, we are missing kind of the great news about the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, here's why. Because the first thing I want you just to write down is this, is that the best news in the good news is resurrection news. The best news in the good news, which is where we get our term gospel, is resurrection news. This is the best news. Paul says, if we leave it at this place that Jesus died for our sins and that's it, then he says, here's the problem. You're still in your sins. Because if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. Because the satisfaction and full payment has not been made in the conquering of death and sin. Sin leads to death. Jesus conquered both. His resurrection is central to the gospel that we now serve and we now follow a risen Savior. Not just a great example, but a risen Savior who, was die, who died and who rose from the dead. This is central. And if we don't believe in the resurrection, then what kind of hope do we have? We have the same kind of hope that everybody else does that's without God. It's all the same at that point. The resurrection is kind of the stepping off point. But let me give you a second thing. Second thing is this, is that Jesus' resurrection is a foretaste of our own resurrection. I don't want you to miss this either. Listen to how it states it in verse number 20. It says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead came also, comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Now here's what I want you to catch hold of. Jesus' resurrection is a foretaste of our own resurrection because he is called the firstfruits of resurrection. Do you understand the term first fruits? You know, you got an apple tree, right? And when the harvest time comes, you can take off the first apples that grew on the apple tree and you can eat them and you can see them and you can taste them and you can touch them. And what they're going to do is they're going to tell you what all of the apples on that tree are going to be like. You take the first ones off and you can say, this is representative of what everything else on the tree is going to be. It is the first fruit, but it is representative. So let's put it this way. Let's say there is a tree called new creation. Jesus is the first fruits of that tree. 
And that means that everyone that is in Jesus, when he appears, is going to have the opportunity to now be made like him. So in other words, we could say it this way. We could say that the fruit of new creation is resurrection. The fruit of new creation is resurrection. In other words, do you know why I know I'm not going to have wings? Because Jesus didn't have wings. Because I am going to be made in his likeness. It hasn't happened yet, but when it does happen, I am going to be made in his likeness, like him. Jesus is the foretaste, his resurrection is the foretaste for what our resurrection is going to look like. This is an incredibly precious truth. Now granted, I don't know what that's ultimately, how God's going to work it out when someone dies as an infant or a child or when they are older. I don't want to come back as older. <laughs> Relax. Everything's made new because the fruit of new creation is resurrection, but don't miss in resurrection the idea of new creation. This is important for us to be able to grab hold of. Because so many times our conception of heaven has nothing to do with resurrection. And I'm trying to blow through that today. I'm trying to put a helmet on and run into that wall that you've created in your head that basically says heaven is some disembodied, unbelievably maybe boring reality that you've just tried to trump up by saying, well, we're going to be in the presence of Jesus and that's going to be cool. We're just going to all chill out. And people are going, this is the hope that you have, that you're going to chill out forever, that you're going to hang out on a cloud and play a harp and you got some wings and you're just going to kind of chill out forever. Listen, I'm not suggesting that it's not comforting to know that when we die, that we are going to rest safely in the presence of Jesus. I am thrilled by that notion, but that's not where we stop. There is so much more that we need to grab hold of and understand when it comes to life after life after death. And this is the ultimate hope that we have. Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize something? that the hope of the Christian faith, faith is not going to heaven when we die. That is not, that has never been the hope. That has never been the hope of people in the world. Let's go to heaven when we die. The hope has been we will rise again. That is the hope. It is not just some disembodied kind of understanding. It is the resurrection that has always been the preaching of the apostles and the hope of the church. It is not just an idea of escapism that says, I just want to get out of this old place and go where I can go because you are going to, you're going to be reminded in a couple of weeks that you're actually not getting out of this place. It's going to be in a couple weeks, but I'll get to it. Now, you know what else it talks about, this idea of resurrection? Not only is the fruit of new creation resurrection, but the resurrection is going to be both tangible and spiritual. Let me help us understand that a little bit because those terms get all conflated in our minds. Look at verse number 42. It says, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, this can be complex, and I want you to stay with me because I'm just, you're getting staked today, okay? You're having to, you have to put your big, if you don't have teeth, put your dentures in. We got to chew. You got things to chew today. 
The idea that Paul is talking about here when he talks about a natural body and a spiritual body, when we start thinking about the idea of spiritual, we always have a tendency to think about spiritual means immaterial, ghost-like, right? That's what we think about when we think of spiritual. We think about non-tangible. That is not the way that Paul is using the term here. The two terms that he's using here, natural, psychikos in the Greek language, and uh, spiritual, pneumatikos in the Greek language, these are two very important terms that we we need not miss. They are not talking about the material existence, the material that, that makes a life. They are talking about the energy that fuels it. That's why the ikos, psychikos, pneumatikos, that's why the ikos are on those words. They're talking about the energy that makes it up. For instance, if I ask the question, what is your car made of? Is it made of metal or is it made of plastic? That's one question, but that does not get to what Paul is trying to describe. If, however, I said, what does your car run on? Electricity or gasoline? Now we're at the kind of question that Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about the energy that motivates what this is. So in other words, spiritual does not mean immaterial. It means completely animated as a new creation by the Spirit. That's what it means. I I know I'm talking rather deep at this point, but I need you to catch this. The reason I want you to understand this is because what Paul is doing when he's describing natural and spiritual, where he's saying one is going to be sown in dishonor, one's going to be raised in glory, right? All of that kind of stuff that he's talking about. Here's what he's not comparing. He's not comparing the idea of immaterial versus material. Like our natural body, you know, we can touch and it's tangible, but then when we die, we're just getting a spiritual body. That's not what he's talking about. He's not comparing immaterial versus material. He's comparing corruptible physicality versus incorruptible physicality. That's what Paul is talking about. Because the resurrected body, ladies and gentlemen, is not immaterial, it is tangible. And spiritual. By spiritual, I mean completely and totally energized as a new creation by the Spirit of God. This is what we need to grab hold of. See, our bodies right now, we struggle because we are animated at times by the Spirit and at other times by our natural flesh. Am I right? That means we're corruptible. But what Paul is arguing for is there's coming a time where you're going to be incorruptible in a tangible existence, not just some ethereal, disembodied, right? Real, touch, feel, hug. That gives me great hope. Let me give you a last thing here. Um, We'll be resurrected when Jesus appears. I don't want you to miss this part either because... In verse number 50, he talks about this idea by using some metaphors. Look at what it says. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, corruptible flesh. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Another way to say that. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, talking about death, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. By the way, you remember those words? Paul actually used those words in 2 Corinthians 5 when he talked about being unclothed and clothed and what he was groaning for. He's using the same terms here. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Now, when is this going to happen? This new creation, this spiritual body that is physical, tangible, that will be animated by the Spirit, when is this going to happen? When Christ appears. That's when it's going to happen. The the imagery that's used there is the idea of 
of a trumpet blast, a last trumpet, talking about the summing up of all things, that this is the time in which we are going to be recreated. So let me give you a quick recap, because I know that I just went on a jet tour. I'm going to give you a quick recap of highlights, and then I'm going to talk to you about quick practical applications, why this matters to us. Okay, ready? Here's the recap. Who? That's the first question. Who is going to be resurrected? Well, Paul would actually answer that question, everyone, believer or not. That's how he would answer the question. We today have only been talking about believers, but Paul would answer the question, everyone. In fact, when Paul was actually standing before the governmental officials in Acts chapter number 24, listen to the words that he used. He said, I've got the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So we'll learn in the next couple of weeks, we're going to learn that there is a resurrection of everyone, but today I've just been spending time talking about the resurrection of the righteous, okay? So who? Everyone. Secondly, what? What kind of resurrection body are we talking about? We're talking about a tangible, real body that is a new creation of the Spirit. That's what we're talking about. A tangible, real body body that is a new creation, in other words, fully animated with no hindrance, fully animated by God's Spirit, a brand new creation. Let me give you a third thing. When is this going to happen? It'll happen at the appearing of Jesus. That's when it's going to happen, all right? And then lastly, where is it going to happen? Probably on the new earth. I'll get to that later. Because what I'm going to do over the course of these next few weeks, we're going to just kind of, we're going to break down some maybe not so good ways of looking at how we've looked at the afterlife and help to rebuild some of those in a way that is much more centered on what the scripture says. All right? Now, listen to me for just a second. Why does this matter to us? I'll tell you. It matters in two ways. It matters because of the comfort that it brings us and the mission that it calls us to. Listen, here's the comfort. I I don't in any way diminish the fact that it is incredibly comforting to know that if I die before the day's end today, that because of my faith and trust in Jesus and what he's done, not because I'm good, not because I'm I'm better than, that I outgood the next guy or outgood the next gal, but because of my faith in Jesus and what he has done, reconciling me to the Father, because of his forgiveness of sin, not my own, because of his resurrection from the dead, demonstrating the sufficiency of his death on the cross for my sin, payment in full, because of what he's done, then that means that if I don't see the end of this day here, that my soul will be resting and cared for and conscious in the care and presence of Jesus. That's comforting. But do you realize that's to me not even the greatest comfort? (laughs) It's really comforting for me to know that, and so I don't diminish that or marginalize that in any way. It's wonderfully comforting to know that. But do you know what I'm super comforted by? There have been people in my life who have died in Christ that I loved. People in my family, people that I've pastored who have died knowing Jesus. There are times when, sometimes in the way that we conceive of things, we kind of just romanticize the scenario by saying, well, here's the great news. When I get to heaven, they'll be able to show me around. Listen, no, they won't. Because when you die, your soul goes to be in the presence of Jesus. There is no question about that. You are consciously in the presence, in a place called paradise. And maybe they might be able to show me around that spot. But there's something else coming an awakening called resurrection. And when we are all resurrected together, 
at the same time, we will enter the new heaven and earth together. Jesus will be showing us all around. My grandfather, my grandmother, my father-in-law, people that I love that have died, all the saints are going to go marching into the new creation together. That is overwhelmingly comforting to me. Secondly, why I think this is so important to teach is because Paul reminds us of the mission that we have. He teaches all about resurrection, and do you know how he ends the chapter? He says it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because, listen, you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Do you know why it's not in vain? Because we are a people of resurrection. We are a people of new creation. It means somehow in the economy of God that as we serve God in the life that we have, that it will endure. That like us, it will not die if it was animated by the Spirit of God. That's why we can stand firm. That's why we can press on in the mission. That's why we can tell every man, woman, and child that they need to know God the Son, the person of Jesus who died for their sins and rose from the grave because we have an enduring hope in the resurrection. And what we do in this life, ladies and gentlemen, that is animated by God's Spirit will live because we are people of the resurrection. That is a wonderful, incredibly empowering part of the mission that God has called us to. So what does that mean? Here's what it means. By the leadership of the Spirit, love. By the leadership of the Spirit, serve. By the leadership of the Spirit, give. By the leadership of the Spirit, Share the gospel. Why? It will endure. We are people of the new creation. We are people of the resurrection. That's why Paul says, I'm teaching you about all of this hope that you have in the resurrection so that you will stand firm and realize that your labor in the Lord is never, ever, ever in vain because we are people of Amen. new creation. You see, when we teach the Bible, when we show people the truth about what God says about the afterlife, it does something with a different kind of hope than the romanticized ideas that we form, but instead gives us a real, genuine, spirit-led hope. So I'm going to ask at this time if we could to just bow our heads for just a moment as we are getting ready to depart and our campus pastors at the other campuses will take over from this place. For those of you that are here, if you've never come into relationship with God through his son, you must realize that he died, he rose from the dead, and that you and I, if we choose to ignore him, we too will die in our sin. But God loved us so much that he gave his son so that we would not have to, that by faith in him, we could be transformed. So at the close of our worship gathering, when I pray, if you feel like you need to talk to somebody about what it means to have a relationship with God through his son, to have your sins forgiven, to have the assurance of his spirit living in you, and to know the hope that is the hope of reality of resurrection, then when we dismiss, I want you to come by the fireside room. Pastors and prayer partners would love to be able to take a moment and talk to you. Father, I, I thank you for your word and what it teaches us, and I thank you for the realization that God, when we really dig into what your, your word says, we find a living hope, a hope that actually empowers us toward living life on mission and with purpose and with endurance and perseverance. And we also find a genuine comfort, not some, not some sentimental comfort, God, but a real, enduring, life-giving comfort that we could never make up on our own. 
So, Father, we want to thank you for that, and we pray that you would continue, God, as we, as we think about and turn our attention toward realities that are beyond us, we be reminded of the greatness of you and how a God who has made all of this possible has loved us so deeply even while we were in our sin so as to send the Lord Jesus to us on our behalf. Thank you that he is the first fruits of resurrection, and we look to his life to see what our destiny is being conformed into his image, even in and through resurrection. So, Father, I pray that you would reshape our minds today and give us a renewed vision for the way you want to use us in this world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, there's an every child table right out there. If you're interested in God's moving in your heart in that way, check it out. God bless you guys. You're dismissed. <laughs>